Uh, so this talk is going to be a uh, more hands-on talk. It's going to be a little more interactive. So I ask you to please uh, raise your hand during the talk and ask questions interactively if you want. Uh, feel free to interrupt me as I go through the code because I'm going to show some code because smart contracts are about code, right? So I want everybody to be able to follow what we're doing here. All right. Okay, so um, before I start, uh, just to gauge a little bit the audience, by a raise of hands, who here has a CS background? Okay. Uh, what about a legal background? Legal. Legal, yeah. Okay, and then what about uh, other backgrounds, like business or finance? Okay. Right, so um, I'll try to make it accessible to everybody, but again, at the same time, um, also give a little bit more uh, juice to the um, CS people. Okay, so the previous speakers talked a lot about what smart contracts are in, in general and gave you a general idea about we, what you can do. Uh, they talked about the decentralized computer, that is the blockchain, and they talked about verifiers on that. So uh, what actually does a smart contract look like? And what I'm going to do in this talk is I will show you the simplest possible smart contract and go through it with you. And the simplest possible smart contract is going to be on Bitcoin. So uh, this is what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what, uh, what Bitcoin looks like in terms of what it is technically. And then uh, we'll, we will talk about the, the first and simplest smart contract that you can have, which is paying someone some money. And I will explain why this is a smart contract, and, uh, and then we'll go through the code together. All right, let's get started. So what is, what is Bitcoin in terms of, of a smart contract? Bitcoin has the, the simplest smart contract capabilities. It has a simple programming language built in, which is called Bitcoin Script. And this is how you write smart contracts in, in Bitcoin. And I think, I feel this is a good introductory example for smart contracts because it's the first smart contracts language that was ever created. And it also provides, it, it works in practice. It's something that we use to, to make payments in, in practice. But at the same time, it's not a very advanced programming language. So it gives a good transition to other blockchains like Ethereum or Cardano, which is why uh, w which is what uh, Daryl is going to be talk talking about later. All right, so uh, in Bitcoin, we have a thing called a transaction. That's the, the primitive unit of Bitcoin. And in my slides, I will draw transactions as circles like that and uh, put edges on the left and on the right to show inputs and outputs to a transaction. All right, so my transaction is going to look like that. And here we have a transaction that transfers money from Alice to Bob. And in these symbols, what I will use is, I will use a circle to illustrate just a transaction, not a particular person who's an owner. Uh, the owners are denoted in the edges, or the, the lines here. So here you have an incoming edge for the transaction. Alice is paying into this transaction. And then you have an outgoing edge, which is Bob getting money out of that transaction. OK, so um, the other thing is that each transaction is going to have, um, each transaction edge is going to have some value associated with it, which is the weight. So I'm going to put some numbers on this. It could be euros if you're, making a, if you're thinking about it in euros, but in fact, they're Bitcoin. It's its own currency, right? Right, so on the left, inputs. On the right, outputs. All right, so when you start making payments, these things form a transaction chain. So you have multiple transactions here where people hand over a Bitcoin from one to the next. So here you have a Bitcoin that was uh, owned by Alice. So this edge is owned by Alice. It's worth one Bitcoin. It goes into a transaction. And this is a transaction where Alice is paying Bob. So here Bob has this amount. And then he's paying it to Charlie. And then Charlie's paying to someone else. So this is a typical thing that you will see in Bitcoin. A coin moves from owner to owner. And this is the transaction chain. And this is different from the, the blockchain that you saw previously. The blockchain is a consensus layer where you actually do the confirmation of these, but this is just a series of payments that happen. All right. And then when you have a dangling edge like that, when you have an, an output edge that doesn't lead to a new transaction, we call this an unspent transaction output. So this edge is going out of a transaction, 
but has not arrived as an input to a new transaction yet. Okay, so this is unspent money. So if Alice sees on the Bitcoin graph that there is one transaction like that of value one Bitcoin, and it's a dangling edge, it's, a, it's some money that she owns. And this is what we mean in Bitcoin by saying, I, I own that many, that many coins. And this is what I see in my actual software wallet. So my software wallet, what it does is it looks at all the transaction uh, on, the, on, the, on the unspent transaction outputs, it sums them up together, and this is what I see on my software. Okay, so this is the UTXO, as we call it. So um, any questions until now? All right. So if Alice wants to pay someone else, so say Bob, what she does is she starts here, she finds this UTXO that has one Bitcoin that is owned by her, and she creates a new transaction to pay someone else. In this case, she wants to pay Bob. So she creates this new node and puts an output on, on this node that is owned by Bob and has the same monetary value in this case. So she wants to pay Bob one Bitcoin. But notice that the, the output edge that was in the UTXO previously that was owned by Alice is not yet connected to the transaction that she created. So she wants to connect it there so that the old output is no longer an unspent transaction output and the new output is now a, a, an unspent transaction output. So this is how we do spending in Bitcoin. Right, so when we do some spending, we want to prove our ownership of the money. And um, how do we do that? Well, we use something called digital signatures and the previous, previous speakers talked a little bit about that. Um, so I, I will not go through the uh, digital signatures details. Um, so you just need to know that this is something that is associated with a public key and cannot be forged. Right, so when Alice is ready to pay Bob in this case, what she does is she performs a digital signature on this thing here that I've circled, the, the red card, right? Because she wants to ensure that this is exactly what cannot be changed later on. She wants to um, create a new output that is associated with Bob's public key. In this case, I write it as Bob. And she wants to make sure that this public key of the new owner cannot be changed by someone. So she authorizes a payment, and that authorization goes to this specific name. Okay, so this is the data that is being digitally signed. All right, so this is a diagram from the original Bitcoin paper that shows a transaction chain, and it's much more complicated than the previous diagrams I have here, so uh, it's, it's one of the um, more complicated ways of talking about it, but it doesn't say anything else than what I showed you before. So basically these rectangles are transactions, and every time you spend a transaction, you connect it with a new one, and then you have to put a signature in, right? So this is one of the, uh, one of the diagrams that Satoshi Nakamoto made, and it means exactly that. All right, so Bitcoin script. Well, a lot of people talk about smart contracts, and they mean Ethereum, and they mean all these uh, new complicated like blockchains, uh, the Turing complete languages, and so on. But actually, Bitcoin allows you to write some smart contracts. It's maybe not well known, but it is a smart contracts language. It is the original smart contracts language. It's, it allows you to do some, um, to write some expressions. And here's a few examples of what Bitcoin can express as a smart contracts language. Uh, one, Alice owns some money. So that's a smart contract that says, Alice can spend this money. Alice and Bob own money together. You can put various rules on that. You can say, um, if Alice has a certain public key and Bob has a certain public key, in order to spend this money that is in their collaborative wallet, we can say that any of them can spend it. So that would be a shared account, like, like a regular shared bank account. Um, you can say that um, they both need to authorize the payments. So this could be uh, a wallet that is used for large amounts in maybe a company. So if you have a, a DAO, a, or a decentralized autonomous organization, you could say that the, the board of directors of that company own a smart contract, own a, a, an account that holds money, and they all need to authorize it. Or you can say that the majority of them need to authorize it by putting in a signature. And then, of course, you can also do something called micropayments, which is something new that we don't really do in traditional money. And this is saying that I'm continuously spending money 
by the second, let's say, by a very small amount of unit. So if I go into a taxi, let's say, for example, um, I don't need to wait for the ride to be over to pay the taxi driver. What we can do is we can establish a, a micropayments channel, and as I ride, I pay by the second every time um, the meter goes one cent over, and when I go get off the car, um, the payment is already made. If I don't have enough money, then uh, the taxi driver can say, you know, you don't have enough money, I can't uh, keep on driving, but I can see the proof happening on the blockchain. Yeah, that was the other question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, how does how does the micropayments channel work since confirmations in Bitcoin happen every 10 minutes and you can't be sure that there is no reorg of the blockchain for the last few blocks? And the way this works is the micropayments happen off-chain. So the transaction happens between the two people, the taxi driver and the person getting in. Um, and they can communicate these transactions, they can exchange them using, for example, Bluetooth, they don't even have to be on the internet. Um, but what they do is they start a payment channel on the blockchain initially, and then that payment channel is used to establish the fact that this money is now blocked for the payments channel until the ride is over, basically, on which case we finalize the payment on the blockchain. So when you do the, the micropayments every second, let's say, this does not go onto a, an on-chain transaction, and this is also how you avoid fees, okay? And this is a basis of, of also more complicated things like layer two, um, layer two technologies like uh, the Lightning Network. Okay, so the Bitcoin script expresses something that we call an encumbrance. Um, this is a program um, written in the language of Bitcoin script and it expresses what kind of property do you need to satisfy in order to be able to spend some money. So basically what this says is when I put in some money in a transaction output, when I put, a mon put some money into a transaction as an input and this has also an output, the output is associated with some sort of code that says, look, in order to spend this money, you need to satisfy such and such properties. And this is exactly what a smart contract is. And this smart contract runs on the decentralized computer of Bitcoin. It runs in a way that cannot be, um, cannot be gained. Um, so we call this an encumbrance because you need to have some sort of proof that you are the rightful owner and you are authorized to spend this money. Okay, and because this is a programming language, you can express more complicated things, more complicated ways of owning money than just this person can own some money. Okay, so instead of having Alice and Bob, in fact, what we do is we use Bitcoin addresses that may, many of you may have seen, but in fact, what, what goes into the blockchain is something like this. It's a piece of code that is associated with each transaction output, and it looks exactly like that, actually, and I'm gonna go through that and explain what this means. All right, so in Bitcoin script, what we do is we run it on a stack machine. Uh, it's a very simple programming language. It's, uh, it's actually pretty ugly. And um, it's a series of, uh, of commands, and they run one after the other. You don't have many abilities. You don't have any loops. You have only some simple statements. Uh, your programs can be only that long. Um, and um, you have some simple ifs, uh, and that's about it. So the encumbrance, what it says is, if you want to spend that money, you have to run that script with some input. So think of it as a, as a programming language function that you give it some parameter. And that function has to return the value one. If it returns the value one, then you have proven that you are authorized to spend. If it returns the value zero, then you're not authorized to spend. Or in case it throws an error during execution. All right. So uh, when there is some UTXO, the creator of the transaction, of the new transaction that wants to spend this UTXO has to prove that the script is outputting one for some sort of parameters that they pass. So we have two notions. One is called the script pop key, which is the fancy name for the computer program that is associated with a transaction output, and the script sig, which is the parameters that we pass to that function. And so what we need to do is to find a script sig that, that when script pop key runs with this parameter, then the program returns uh, one. Okay, so here's how it runs. 
First, we take the script sig that the attempted spender put in the network. Uh, so we put these in the, the decentralized computer stack, and then um, we run the commands that are found in script pop key one by one. And each of these commands can change the stack until the program either crashes or the stack um, has only one item that is a one. And if it's a one, then we can say that the amount was spent correctly. All right, so pay to pop key is the first way to spend money that Bitcoin invented. So let's take a look at actually the code of that. And what this does is it allows you to express something like a bank check or like a, a bank note, uh, but without the, the notion of a centralized trusted third party like a government or a bank, right? So here's the script. It's just two lines of code. It's the script pop key seen there. So in this script, you see uh, one concept and one operator. Okay, and then here's the input that we give to that script, the parameter that we pass to that script in order to prove that we are the authorized owner. Okay, so how this runs is as follows. First, the script sig portion has a constant which is a signature. There's a digital signature that is given by the spender. Okay, so this is put up in the stack. So I will use the left hand side for the stack. So while this program runs, sigma gets put in the stack. And then the script pop key runs. Now, the first command of the script pop key runs, and this is a constant, so this gets also pushed onto the stack. And now we have two items in the stack, two elements in the stack. And then this important operator is ran. And this operator, what it does is it implements in Bitcoin the notion of a digital signature. So what this says is, look, make a check that this signature, this digital signature, was made with this public key. So take the two top elements of the stack, check that this signature was made with this public key, and then check that the signature is made on the data, which is the new transaction. Right. So this is exactly the authorization that we need when we um, make a payment with Bitcoin. So once this is done, if the signature and the public key are correct, then this should output a one. Okay, so um, do you have any questions? Are you following this? Yes? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's a good question. And the question was, how does the induction of all these transactions start? Where is the first transaction? Well, in case of Bitcoin, there is some special transactions that are called Coinbase transactions that are uh, the way Bitcoin gets created. And this is a process called mining by which these transactions are created in newly created blocks. Um, and currently, every time a miner creates a block every 10 minutes, they get a reward, which is part of the, the Coinbase transaction. And this is similar to minting money in traditional, uh, well, money minting facilities, except it's decentralized. Okay, so every transaction has to eventually, if you if you follow back the trail, it has to lead back to a a Coinbase transaction. Okay. Right. Other questions about this? All right. So. This very, so you can see that the, the one who pays put in, puts in the public key here, which specifies who is the recipient of this money. And the recipient of this money doesn't really have to actually take it or do anything about it. They just leave it on the blockchain. They, they leave it hanging on transaction until they need to pay someone else. Yes? So I'm, I'm still trying to understand this. You're saying that it's like a bank note, but from your description, it sounds like it's a personal check. I am sending you a check, and you are the named recipient. Only yeah. you can cash it, right? Or is it a banknote? It's it, no, it has my name on it, it but it doesn't, it doesn't require it doesn't require your account to be full. So when I spend it, there's no check. Right, you have that money, right? There's a different scheme. Right. Uh, so when you pay me, you already have to have the money. So it's a cashier's check. It's yeah. actually a check that that confirms that the funds exist. But it has your name, and 
then after yeah. the transaction, whatever you but, give. But yes, yeah. exactly. But that's, no. that's just nothing to do with the program. You don't pass the program that has the same requirements afterwards. Onwards from this transaction, you don't. You're not obliged to pay the same way. Where when someone needs to establish their identity. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'll take it offline. We'll okay. Talk. Great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this specifies that this public key is able to spend this money. And if I own this public key, I can just leave this as an output in a transaction. And uh, I can use it whenever I like, whenever I have to pay something. OK. And then in, in more recent versions of Bitcoin, we have something called the paid public key hash, which is a little bit more complicated, but not much. And uh, maybe it's also one of the simplest scripts that you can find. It looks like that. So instead of providing a public key, I'm providing uh, a public key hash. So that's equivalent to a public key. Um, but um, it goes through this special mathematical function that takes the public key and maps it uh, in a one-way fashion into a string that looks like that. And that's very close to what we call a Bitcoin address today. OK, so this script does something more, a little bit more complicated. It has to check that the public key, once hashed, gives this value, and then use that key to authorize the payment with JXIT as we did here. OK, so let's go through this script and see what it does. So first, again, we put in what is given as a script sig into the stack. And this time, we have to give both the public key and the signature. Now we execute the, the script pub key, and this does a, a duplication of the top of the stack. So now we have twice the public key. Then it does a hashing of the top of the stack. So now we have the hash of the public key. And then it puts in this constant that was spe specified by the spender on top of the stack. And then it does something called an equal verify. So it basically checks that the two items on top of the stack are um, the ones that, um, that they're matching. So this verifies that the owner is the one that it should be. And once this is done, these are removed. And then a regular check sig happens the same as before. And if this succeeds, then this outputs a one again. OK, so this completes a pay to pop key hash. And um, if you look at the Bitcoin network, uh, the vast majority of transactions today are just this. So it's just payments that are saying, yeah, this is the public key hash that you, sh you should be paying to. And uh, that's all. OK, so here, uh, yeah. Okay, so the question is, why do we need to hash the um, public key while uh, while this uh, costs us some operations, and what is the benefit of that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the reasoning behind that, I, I've not seen a formal proof of this, but the reasoning behind this is as follows: If the elliptic curve cryptography that uh, powers Bitcoin is somehow broken in the future but in a way that is not completely broken. So um, let's say that you can, in, you can find from a given elliptic curve public key, you can find the respective private key, but in an amount of time that is not a few seconds. Let's say it's maybe a year, okay? Uh, then this provides security while the previous script doesn't. And why this is, is this doesn't make the public key public. This only makes the hash of the public key public. So when you make a payment to someone, you, you just publish the hash. If you use the previous one and you made a payment, you would publish their public key, and it could have been reversed. So here, if you want to attack this system as it is published on the blockchain, you have to both um, inverse the hash and also break elliptic curve cryptography. Okay, But uh, because blocks are confirmed every 10 minutes, when the script sig is provided for this, you only have access to the public key for 10 minutes. And then this is the window in which you can double spin. And after that, it goes, it goes into a block, so you cannot, you cannot longer spin, right? OK, so uh, this completes my introduction of, uh, of the Bitcoin script language. So I showed you a, a simple script. And um, just as, as a way to motivate the Daryl's talk, I will show you a more complicated script just, just to see it. Uh, it looks like that. And, um, you can see this is this is not very <laughs> decryptable. You can't really read it, right? Even if you're an expert programmer or if you've worked with Bitcoin, it's very very hard to 
understand what this does. So um, I will, I will um, put up the slides on the site, as, as, uh, as all slides, it will be on the site. And you can look at it and see if you can figure it out. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what it does. What it does is it allows me and Daryl to, uh, to do a remote coin flip. So what we can do together with this, once we create this transaction, is I can flip a coin. And if tails happens, then Daryl wins the money that we have bet. Otherwise, I win it. So basically, we both put in one Bitcoin, and whoever wins gets out two Bitcoin, right? With probability one half each, right? So this is a more complicated smart contract, and you can do it in Bitcoin just fine. And um, yeah, it works. It's, it's basically an implementation of, of gambling. And there's, of course, no physical coins involved. And in this particular case, um, it can be so that Daryl is malicious, and I'm still um, certain that even if he plays in whatever way he wants to, I am, I am sure that I will win with probability one half. Okay, so um, the problem with these contracts is that their security is really, really problematic and you can't really look at the code and figure out what it does, let alone if it's secure. So we need more, more concrete languages that provide provable security and we can reason about them. So Dan will show us uh, what he's working on, which is a language that provides uh, provable security for smart contracts. So let's welcome Dara.